Okay, we will start and people in any case can join us as we go. Um, welcome all to the 12th episode in a series of webinars showcasing the use cases and benefits of Copernicus, the Earth observation component of the EU space program. My name is Sofia Oteruomono. I'm part of the Copernicus support office and I'll be your moderator today. This 12th webinar looks at how Copernicus data can be used to implement the EU's regulation on forest preservation, focusing mainly on how Copernicus can monitor deforestation and forest degradation. I should mention that this webinar is being recorded and will be shared on the Copernicus EU uh, YouTube channel. Uh, to make the webinar a bit more interactive, we'll be using Slido for live questions. If you have downloaded WebEx, you will find Slido to the right-hand side of your screen in the Apps tab. If you're joining us directly from your browser, you can access Slido using the link that we will share in a moment in the chat. Um, you may respond to the questions that we will post there on, on Slido as we go, but also you may ask any questions based on the content presented today. So please feel free to type in your questions so that we may answer them during the Q&A sessions uh, after each one of the presentations. Now, as an initial icebreaker, uh, we, we have put on Slido one of first question. Let me let me share it also, share the link on the chat. There you go. Um, so our first uh, question today is, how would you rate your knowledge about Copernicus? Now let's uh, go through the agenda for today. We will have two presentations from experts in the field. Inge Jonker uh, from the Food and Agriculture Organization and Frédéric Ajard from the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. Following each of their presentations, we will open the floor to you, the audience, to ask any questions that you may have. So, as I said, please feel free to type in your questions on Slido. So, our first speaker for today is Dr. Inge Jonker. Uh, Inge is an environmental engineer with a PhD in applied bioscience and engineering. She worked at the University of Milan and she was guest lecturer of the geomatics group at the Department of Land Management at KU Leuven. Uh, combined, uh, this was combined with a mandate as science uh, program manager for environment at the European Science Foundation in Strasbourg. Uh, she started working at uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization as remote sensing expert in 2009. And since 2010, she's working as team leader of the remote sensing group in the team focused on reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation and national forest monitoring. Uh, this FAO team uh, supports developing countries to set up national monitoring, reporting and verification systems. Inge is also an official reviewer for land use, land change, and forestry at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change since 2012, and is lead author for agriculture, forestry, and other land uses in the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, since 2017, and lead author for the sixth assessment report of the IPCC. Now, without further ado, Inge, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sofia, for this very um, broad introduction. So I'm going to try again to share my screen. Please let me know if it's fine, if you can see it. We can see it in full screen. Yeah. Okay, great. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk here. So indeed, I work in the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN. I hope you're all uh, aware of this. Um, there's a forestry department, and so there I'm in the forest and the climate team. And I will talk a bit about the forest monitoring we do indeed in the reduction of emission of deforestation and degradation, and then mainly the added value of remote sensing. So uh, to go back, and as you said in the introduction, um, I'm wearing my IPCC hat for the first slide. Um, why do we do all this and why also Copernicus is doing this? Uh, maybe good to just to recall, um, as you know, the IPCC published the climate change mitigation adaptation in the physical science last year the climate change mitigation, so in which we also have all the activities on forestry, was published last June. And maybe just to recall why we're here and why we're in this webinar, so we're not on track to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. I think this is the broader framework in which we should see all this. Um, I think you're familiar with the graph, at least people working with climate change. So not to go into all the details, but to show we really have to do something. And so one of the big actions is to reduce emissions. Deforestation and degradation um, takes part of this as forest activities. So the climate crisis is here. The monitoring and also forecasting of forest and land has become more crucial than ever. 
Um, but I think more, a lot of people in this webinar are working with forestry, uh, hence the interest. Um, there's different scales on which we work and maybe a bit different from the, the pure European focus is that, as you might know, FAO is a UN agency. We work also on the global and national level, also in developing countries. Um, there's a lot of global scale, global data also here in-house. There's a forest resource assessment, so that's global data uh, on the state of forest. Uh, national scale, very often we use global data used nationally or national data for different international reporting frameworks. And also there I will highlight the role um, Copernicus can and may, may play. Local scale, um, both mitigation and adaptation. So more and more also adaptation has come into play. We're trying to do the mitigation, but it seems that uh, we might not get there without also starting the adaptation. So FAO doesn't work uh, in a silo. It's linked with Silva Carbon, which is the US part of um, developing um, agency for USGS. We work with ESA, NASA, Academia, all other partners, and then the GEO4I also to be mentioned because also ESA is part of this. It's a global forest observation initiative. Um, just to show you that countries have progress reporting to the UNFCCC. So you mentioned before the United Nations framework on climate change is the big um, agency to which countries report on reference level, specifically for forestry. So you can see starting in 2014, when Brazil was really the leading uh, country and the only country, uh, while now in 2023, you see the wide variety of countries who have submitted the forest reference level, showing that they really want to do something uh, on the degradation and the, the deforestation. And then in the blue part of this slide, you can see the countries which have received payments. So on Red Plus results, they have um, not only payments, but also they have shown that they really reduced um, their emissions and that they want to show the results. So you can see, just to go, not to go to all the countries, the big difference over the last 10 years. Also geographically, of course, there's a lot of developing countries on this reference level submitted and then also the Red Plus results submitted. And then uh, the activity data, so that's the main part where remote sensing comes in. Um, so we've been working over 10 years on MRV on this, uh, helping countries to report to the UNFCCC. And of course, we're very happy that 90% of the countries used our open source tools, which I will mention in a minute. And we also give technical assistance. Of course, it's our mandate. It's a mandate of FAO. We do support countries on this. So uh, it's also nice to see that more and more countries uh, pick in on this. So the good thing to see also is that the number of the countries really monitoring these forest area with the help of remote sensing. Um, this is also going from 2014 to 2022. And also the capacity really increased from 55 countries. So in the FRA, so the forest resource assessment to 99 countries in 2020. So it means that really a lot of more and more countries using remote sensing data, thanks to capacity building and knowledge transfer um, from the Western countries. So this is a huge achievement. So why is this important? Um, well, we all know that better data increases trust. Trust is very much needed. It's also not just about reporting, but also uncertainty is very crucial. So we have to be able to say how sure we are the numbers uh, we report, transparency, and that the magnitude and the trend may change with better data. So this is um, a figure out of, a publication from a colleague um, in Forest to show the difference over the different years, also in um, better data and the trust on deforestation. So linked to activity data, of course, we need emission factors if we want to do the greenhouse gas inventory. Um, so there has been 60 countries submitting the reference levels, as you might have seen in the first slides. But most countries have national forest inventory, so they go onto the ground, or they have inventory data they can use for deforestation uh, emission factors. Of course, that's challenging because, well, countries who don't have national forest inventory, they have to rely on satellite data and default factors if they don't have own data. Um, challenge still remains the national forest inventory data for degradation. The national forest inventory data for afforestation and reforestation is always a challenge. And then we should also take advantage of multiple cycles um, of national forest inventory. So here you can see also, thanks to uh, Marike Sandke from FAO, the data used for emission factors. 
So you can see that 86% of the countries uses NFI data to assess the emission factors for deforestation. So they use own data for these emission factors. 93 of the submissions use inventory data. So it's never a remote sensing data without ground data. And very rarely, as said before, NFI provides data for afforestation, and we do need the IPCC default values for the gap filling. So the numbers of countries here with very good to good NFI capacities also increased. And so that's also a very nice outcome of the capacity building ongoing over the years, thanks to implementing agencies. So why do countries do that? And also in line with new regulations, there's of course the complicated landscape of carbon finance. So countries do uh, submit their forest reference level and very often it's because they wanna have access to the climate finance. Um, I won't go into detail of all of these options. So there's result-based payments, there's compliance markets and voluntary carbon markets, each of them with different standards. And so with submitting um, reference levels and other data reporting needs. Uh, here you can see some of the technical requirements for the different standards. Different activities are often taken into account, so mostly it's deforestation and then forest degradation is on number two. The reference period under which you have to report changes as well, so it can be average emissions, sometimes it's five years, 10 years, 20 years. So this is also why it shows that it's so crucial to have uh, remote sensing data when there's no national forest inventory. And then the approach can be historical and activity data, sample based or uh, pixel count. So what does FAO do and what have we done in over the last 10 years? So I'll show you a few of the initiatives we have been. So there's an open forest initiative. Um, so it's a suite of modules, free and open source. And the methods are made for data collection, analysis and reporting of forestry data. Um, maybe the most important part for this seminar is the CPAL, which I'm come to a minute. So CPAL is an online cloud processing um, uh, algor uh, algorithms all united on the cloud. And so it's called the System for Earth Observation, Data Access, Processing and Analysis. Um, well, we're very proud of it because we started in 2013. It's based on a request of countries. There's a whole lot of users. So here you can see there's 35,000 users. It's all open source, freely available, and it's used in over more than 195 countries. So um, for us, at least, that's a great success, especially because there have been so many downloads. So there's a whole community behind this. The software development, as said before, so we're not a research institute. We really collaborate with academia. And so new and improved versions of tools which are existing have been incorporated. The collaboration um, in FAO itself, so between departments, but also with Google, with NASA, with ESA, the testing has been done in countries. There's a training sessions with uh, of capacity building. And so the implementation is done also in national forest monitoring systems. So specifically for degradation and deforestation. So CIPAL here it's again, so free and open. Here is the link. So anyone can register uh, for the access. All you need is an internet connection to really access. It's also um, available on the mobile. So you can see, here on the bottom, all the different partners. So this is not a standalone initiative. It's really thanks to all of the partners that we are where we are now, actually. Um, so the interesting thing for this webinar is as well, so the full archive of all open data is available there. So we're talking about the sentinels, especially the, of course, the optical sentinels for the forestry um, and the vegetation, but then also Sentinel-1 um, is available there. The modules are very different. So here, for example, this is one on the stratified random sampling and accuracy assessment. So as said before on the data, it's very important to have uncertainties always with whatever we do on estimating. And so here's also another uh, module example. So it's based on Jupyter Notebooks. It uses the available um, remote sensing data. I said all the open data, but then it's based on the Google Earth Engine and it links it up to there. So it can be customized. Uh, we really work with the, with countries, with governments, with practitioners, how we can better um, help them in what they want to achieve. And so this is one based on time series. Um, and you can see there's always a virtual processing cost because thanks to the um, loyal Norwegian uh, NICFI, who's um, supporting all this, it's free of use for everybody, um, just the processing part. 
So another option in these open forest suites is a collect urn. So it's a visual interpretation tool for land use cover and forest reclassification and also change detection. So there's access to high and very high resolution imagery. So uh, the good thing is a part of the Sentinels, uh, the Landsat, we also have an archive of planet data. So very high resolution, which can be combined with these others. And so it allows also for very high resolution uh, access and multi-temporal imagery um, and data collection with Google Earth. So this is, for example, the interface you would have if you would use the Collect Earth. So it can be used um, for validation, um, for example, from products and maps. So this is another example using some Sentinel data from the CAFI, which is a project in Africa, uh, really looking to different um, applications in the forestry and forestry activities. So there's a lot of frameworks. Um, a lot of these developing countries, but also European countries, have to report to a lot of different frameworks. So there's a lot, a lot of indicators, statistics needed. Um, very often there are similar indicators, and most of the time it's the same data that's used for the reporting. Also, if you think of the SDGs, for example, we do have also land in there. So what we try to do is to harmonize the, the use of the same data for all these different reporting frameworks and make it also the reporting lighter for countries. Um, so based on all this, I think we can say that the impacts of certain international climate policies on reducing emissions have really shown as being useful, uh, for example, for deforestation. So this is why, of course, we're looking forward to these new uh, regulations and also see how it can improve transparency, especially in the forestry sectors. Something which also was mentioned in the IPCC report, and now I'm wearing my hat again on the IPCC, is that this achieving of these ambitious climate goals really relies on international cooperation. So we do have a role for these transnational partnerships for playing really the role as transfer of technology, knowledge and experience. Um, also there, Copernicus has a great role to share and has shown to really be able to do so. Um, it's, in the forestry world, there's still sometimes um, said that remote sensing cannot solve it all. It's true, it cannot solve it all, but it's great to have long data records of Earth's observation for validation assets, monitoring and early warning, um, cost benefit is higher than the damage fund. Remote sensing is great for the process understanding. Um, the importance of free and open data, I think uh, we all agree on this now, but still important to mention. So the role of Copernicus, the role of Sentinels, it's very, very important for all these products uh, in order to achieve what we're doing now. Also, maybe good to say that the Earth Observation is a tool. It's not the end goal. Um, so it's important also for capacity building to explain. So we use remote sensing data in order uh, to get to the results, because one thing is the monitoring, but also the law enforcement that's at the end the last step who needs to be there and then the potential to discuss monitoring of indicators uh, there's a lot of international frameworks geo and CEOs um, in the remote sensing world which also should be connected to all of this and which we try to integrate in what we do so to interlink the end users and then the scientific community uh, this is a slide we also always try to show so the scientific committee uh, community is, is great in finding new options, also in the domain of forest. But, uh, from our end users perspective as far, we really think that taking into account the user requirements is really crucial um, from the beginning, if possible, because then also people really feel part of it. So there's ownership of the data, uh, especially when it's open data, then it's great because then they also can um, work on it. And then I said before, so this policy frameworks, I don't want to be exhaustive or just to mention a few. So we have these new regulations as we're talking about today, the UN Convention of Combating Desertification and Land Degradation, and the SDGs, for example, just to name a few. So yeah, uh, back to then the whole crisis and where we're here, why do we have to reduce these emissions? So I think the evidence is clear, at least based on these reports. So it's not just uh, some crazy scientists who come up with this. It's really based on over 18,000 peer review um, publications. So I think we can agree that there's quite some basis to say the time for action is now. So thank you very much. I think that was my last slide. So this is, this is my email if you want to contact me. Please follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. And this is the website for people who are interested. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, Inge, for this very interesting presentation. And as I mentioned before, we now open the floor to any questions uh, from the audience. In fact, we already have uh, two here. Um, I think so. The first uh, question is, will there be a forest baseline map for 2020 showing the different types of forests that uh, EUDR, so the new regulation that the EU has uh, developed for um, forest uh, protection uh, defines? Mm -hmm. um, there I, I just a clarification for the audience. I assume they're mentioning 2020 since the cutoff date uh, defined by the regulation is precisely the 31st of December of 2020. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now, from what I know, there is no plan to create a general baseline map, but I'm guessing applications like yours can help. By the way, mm. you're still sharing your screen. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll stop sharing. So, yeah, uh, I think this is a good question actually for Frederic, who uh, also works more in this uh, map making world. So, as said, we mainly uh, support countries on the national scale. Uh, so, we help them also if they want to recreate a map, but it's not our mandate to make these maps. I'm sure there are going to be people jump on making global baseline maps um, from the scientific world. As you know, there's Global Forest Watch, the WRI is making these global products annually. So I'm sure there's going to be um, initiatives to try to tackle the, the question. From FAO, there's the Global FRA Remote Sensing, but it's also not a map making business. So I don't think FAO from that part uh, is best placed to do these things, but I'm sure I, I would expect that things will come up. So, um, but more from the scientific world and from end user world as a uh, FAO. I hope that uh, answers the question. And and I think you also answered the second question, which are what other support tools have been planned for operators under the UDR? What precisely tools like this can, like the one you presented, or tools that yeah. can be developed through our observation data can, yeah. can help? Yeah, as I said, so far it's not a research institute, so we're very happy to apply existing tools and then to merge them in the CEPAL. So, of course, if there's a tool that will come up in the scientific world, we will be more than happy to integrate. And of course, uh, most of the developing countries where we work, they will also be much more very affected by these regulations. So it's also looking forward to having means and tools um, to deal with that. So I think only by joint collaboration with the research world, we'll, we'll get there. So that's why it's very nice to have this um, webinar at this stage so that we can at least prepare for what's coming. It's, it's very interesting to see all the all the synergies that can be created between different organizations and, exactly. and research and academia to yeah. to actually have an impact on things as important as climate change and uh, stopping deforestation. And in that sense, I, I have a question um, because you mentioned this uh, CEPAL tool and I was wondering what were the main challenges that you faced when developing it? Mm. Well, um, it's maybe good to go back to why we developed it. So basically, as you mentioned in my, in my long intro, so I'm working in FAO since 2009, um, working so in developing countries. At that time, it was before the Landsat archive was open, so it was really challenging even to get data, to get uh, imagery. And then all the imagery was brought to developing countries on hard disk, which then with all the problems of it from the practical point of view. So this is why we came up with the idea of the clouds, and I have to say it has been a great... A way to achieve. So maybe just in a nutshell, I think the most difficult part was the trust um, of countries to really share the data on a cloud. So um, the big change of having your data in your closet and really close to you because data is power uh, more and more, although we now we are in a big data um, era, I would say we have much more data. Uh, so really to gaining trust of people to share data on a cloud, even though on, uh, let's say, protected cloud based services was really, really challenging. But I think that with opening the Landsat archive, we also saw that um, the use of, the, of remote sensing was much more picked up um, also for non-commercial activities. And so especially in developing countries, because they were not let's say, uh, dependent on licenses for specific data. And so in that sense, I think the most, the biggest challenge was really the trust for these new technologies. And I think we came a long way. It's not ideal yet. And I know for the data sharing, there's still a lot of issues and there's still need for data sharing agreements. But I think we came a long way. And I think uh, that was the most challenging thing for the CEPO. And in that sense, uh, to to acquire people's trust and to actually get them to share the data with you, hasn't it helped uh, that 
now that the tool is out there and that they can benefit from it, doesn't that facilitate a bit or make them more prone to, to sharing the data? Yeah, yeah, definitely, because uh, I can say that since a few months, for example, a country as Uganda has decided to freely share all their open data uh, and all their products. So they're really proud of what they have achieved because they really see that the products they have made are their own. So it's not a product that was put on them. And so they're really, really uh, eager to share. So I hope more countries will follow. And in a way, also all the global products push a bit the national data to be out because it's not that it's that we don't have any idea of what's going on which was uh, before maybe the case but now we do have some idea and so showing transparency is a very big status also for donors in order to maybe to access climate finance so it's um it's a circle yeah that's that's great to hear and i have just one final question uh from from the audience um uh, First of all, they thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, and they ask if there are any high resolution um, images uh, available for validation for West Africa. Mm. There are, uh, that's, uh, I can happily say yes to this because as mentioned in my presentation, NICFI, who is the Norwegian Development Agency, we have a contract with them for the next two years at least, and most likely till 2030, they um, sponsoring the uh, planet data, so it's high resolution data from um, for the tropics. And so it's freely available. It's available through the CPAL. So I would encourage everybody who's interested there to register simply on CPAL and then you can freely access and use it always for non-commercial activities, of course. Perfect. Thank you once again for your very interesting presentation and for answering all of our questions. Uh, I'm sure that the audience uh, enjoyed your presentation as much as I did. <laughs> and um, now, uh, before we go to our second uh, presentation for today, uh, I just wanted to share a new question on Slido with the audience. Uh, we are curious to know if this is the first Copernicus webinar that you attend. And now, our second speaker uh, today is Dr. Frédéric Achard. Uh, Frédéric is a senior scientist at the Joint Research Center of the European Commission based in Italy. He got a PhD from the University of Toulouse and joined the JRC, the Joint Research Center, in 1992. Uh, his current research uh, interests include the development of Earth observation techniques for the global monitoring of forest resources and the assessment of implications of forest uh, cover changes on the global carbon budget. Frédéric, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sofia, for this uh, kind introduction. Uh, yes, as I confirm, as Sofia is mentioning, I'm working um, the Joint Research Center is the Directorate General of the European Commission. So we are giving technical support to the other services of the European Commission, and I'm based in Northern Italy. So what I will um, try to illustrate, or at least give you a flavor, is the... Um, I just try to share my screen. I hope that you can see now my screen. Yes, we can. Uh, so I will uh, try to illustrate, to give you a flavor how, how the Copernicus program, so I, which includes both data, apart from observation data and services, can help in um, tackling the issue of deforestation and forest degradation. I am not the, the Copernicus program is under the responsibility of another DG, uh, DG DEFIS, Defense and uh, Industry and Space. So I'm not here as um, talking on behalf of, uh, of the Copernicus program or the DEFIS people. As I said, the GRC is supporting all the, the other uh, services of the, of the European Commission, including DEFIS, inclu including DG Environment, and etc. So we, we, we are doing independent science research to support, support uh, uh, any kind of policies developed by European uh, Commission services. So what I will show first is a, uh, a bit the policy background. I understand that uh, the, the regulation, the new, this new regulation that has been put in place by the European Union on the uh, what is called deforestation free products has attracted a lot of attention uh, in relation to what Copernicus can do. So I will start by illustrating, uh, giving a, uh, some background on that regulation, and then I will illustrate what the Copernicus program data or services can, will be able or could provide, could, how it could help. 
in, in tackling this um, this topic. So first of all, the, the in the as I said in the policy framework, uh, there was a communication. So the European Commission has made a communication in 2019, so four years ago, with a, a set of key actions to be implemented by the com, uh, European Commission. And one of these actions was to develop a new regulation. Uh, and that was achieved by um, this regulation has been developed in the last four years and has been published in the official journal of the European Union at the at the end of uh, May and has been and it was entering into force in June. So it's very recent. And this regulation is about the main scope is to minimize the impact of the EU on deforestation and forest degradation at the global scale everywhere. Even if we know the global deforestation is mostly happening in tropical countries, the degradation is happening uh, um, is happening everywhere. So, and in that there is also um, in, in that context the development of, um, uh, of what we call the EU Forest Observatory. It's a nickname. The full name is Observatory of on Deforestation and Forest Degradation, and that is under the responsibility of the GRC or on, of our institution. I will. I may come back on that, and I may also answer to the question that was the chat on the preparation of a baseline global baseline forest map. So, in the regulation, in that uh, very fresh regulation, uh, as the nickname, deforestation free supply chain regulation, the the word Copernicus appears three times. It appears in the introduction, in the recitals of the, the recitals are points which which are made in the introduction, and it appears in one of the articles of, of the of the regulation. I may not may not go in very detail, but the recital one of the recitals of thirty one is about the establishment of this uh, uh, forest observatory on deforestation and forest degradation, which is being established by ourselves by GRC, and that will use existing monitoring tools, including uh, Copernicus products. Uh, it appears in the, in the recital 449, where uh, they mention the geolocation coordinates because the, um, in that regulation, the operators the, which are importing commodities from uh, from, third, from third countries or commodities which are wood which is produced in Europe, they will have to provide the geolocation coordinates of the plots of the, the farms or the plots where the, the uh, these commodities are coming from. So the, here again, the Copernicus, Galileo, and Copernicus are mentioned as potential uh, data sources. And finally, in one of the articles on the, in the regulation uh, related to the checks uh, to be made by member states on operators, uh, there is also uh, mentioning that the, 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 the member states, the competent authorities in the member states, for checking the declarations of the operators, can use means uh, and any technical means, including of observation data from the Copernicus program. So just to say that the Copernicus is seen in that regulation as a source of a potential source of, of, of information. Also to give, give a bit more um, detail of visually information on that regulation, the, how baseline maps, what we call baseline maps, forest map could be used in the regulation. The operators, so the private operators, the, the, the companies which will uh, provide uh, these key commodities. There's a list of seven commodities like soy, cat, uh, cattle, cocoa, coffee, palm oil, uh, rubber, wood, and probably I uh, forget one. So these seven commodities, once they will be provided to the EU market, uh, they will have to be deforestation free, for deforestation and forest degradation free. So the, the 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 operators will can will will be it's not mentioned legally. In the, there is no mention in the regulation of a legal use of a, of a baseline map. But of course, for their due diligence, so for their risk assessment, any kind of maps forest map will help them to assess the risk of having um, one of the plots. Uh, being um, being forest in at the uh, cut of date, it means at the 31 of December 2020. So any kind of maps, uh, global or national, uh, that can be uh, made available at a good accuracy will be useful in that uh, respect for for the risk assessment uh, phase. That's for the 
the, 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 the context of the, the regulation of the, this uh, recent um, uh, need, policy need, uh, the data, what can be the data, Copernicus data, which will be, can be used in that for producing in particular this uh, forest, uh, potential forest baseline map for the uh, end of year 2020. Uh, there is a number, mostly the Sentinel data from uh, with high resolution imagery from the Copernicus program, like Sentinel-1, which is a SAR, uh, synthetic aperture radar instruments, or the Sentinel-2, which is an optical sensor at 10 meter resolution, are the most appropriate for providing uh, forest maps with uh, very high, uh, at a high resolution, uh, and they are uh, high spatial resolution. They exist since the year 2015-16, so they are, there is a lot of data for the year 2020, for, for the uh, target date. So this data, I uh, don't want to go in detail, there is a, Copernicus has developed a, a data space ecosystem, a website where all information on this kind of data sets can be uh, consulted. What I want to illustrate is um, a bit uh, based more on my expertise, what can be done with Sentinel-2, the, the optical data. Uh, there is also the, one of the components of the global land service, so Copernicus is already running Kind of, um, what is called Sentinel-2 Global Mosaic Service, so it's a component of the Global Land Service, which provides access to more than mosaics, there are, there are composites of Sentinel-2 imagery. The point with Sentinel-2 is that as it's an optical sensor, you still get a number of clouds on the imagery, in particular over cloudy regions like the tropics, so the, composite, the compositing um, methods allows to get a bit uh, rid of this, uh, these issues of cloud, cloud coverage. So there is already a service uh, running where uh, users can, potent interested users can request on demand uh, access to mosaics by, by defining a period and, 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 and location. I don't, uh, for illustrating that, uh, at GRC was done, we have done also um, uh, in, in a past project, we have prepared, prepared Sentinel-2 composites for between 2000 uh, years, between 2017 and 2020 on a yearly base. It's available on, on our website. It's just, it's just uh, as an illustration of that, what kind uh, that you can get annual cloud-free mosaics, which are quite um, useful, at least to give a, a first feeling of what, what is uh, happening in terms of vegetation change, vegetation cover change in uh, in, uh, in any kind of, here we have provided the tropics, but it can be applied to any kind of the regions. And the two examples which are presented here are uh, Sarawak in Malaysia and um, Eastern Madagascar. I may, if I have enough time, I may do a short uh, demo of the, the website to show you the, 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 the full scale of, uh, of this uh, mosaics. This is again only illustration, they are existing on the food S2 global S2 GM uh, product. I don't illustrate. We have also on our website some uh, availability of Sentinel-1 uh, uh, composites, but uh, uh, that all this kind of data are, can be uh, really useful for the assessment of deforestation. Here, what I illustrate is an also a very recent product from the European um, side. It has been funded by the European Space Agency, and um, it's a global uh, world cover map of year 2020. At 10 meter resolution, it's based. It has been made by a consortium of European institutions. It's um, uh, based on a combination of the use of Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data for the full year of 2020. The accuracy of that map is 75 uh, percent. You have to bear that in mind. The, the accuracy when people are, are talking about baseline map or reference map, if you have an accuracy of 75 percent, it means that one pixel every four is not correct. So that's so, uh, and it, they, 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 yeah, there's no any kind of map as nev you never have a hundred percent accuracy. That's important to, to understand. No, another point what I want to make on this map uh, of this kind of product is that it's um, uh, it's 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 uh, it's, uh, it's uh, illustrate land cover and not uh, land use. So the detail for on the left side you have the extract. Of the, it's a Kalimantan uh, Iceland which is part of uh, Malaysia and Indonesia. And you see the, the, the map, uh, the world cover map of 2020 on the left side. And on the right side, it's a map that we have produced at GRC that I also can illustrate later on, which is more of focusing on the forest and where we have overlaid um, what is appearing in pink are the, 
plantations of palm oil or rubber. So the, a land cover map, a typical land cover map at global level, will map, map trees or shrubs or, or, savanne or grassland. And in the trees, it will uh, be confusing putting together any kind of trees, including tree plantations, uh, such as uh, palm oil, which are seen as trees from, from satellite imagery, or cocoa, cocoa also small trees, or rubber, which are uh, real trees. So th there's always this issue, in particular for the re new regulation, to be able to separate what are the natural forest, if you wish, from, from the plant tree plantations, from the agricultural tree plantations and rubber plantations, uh, so which is a, a big issue. It's a bit technical, so I don't want to insist, but just to let you know that it's a key issue in the, in, in, in the, in the support for, for the, the regulation, the deforestation free regulation. The next step under Copernicus is that there will be, a under the global land service, there will be a, a future component we are uh, GRC, we are uh, in the phase of, we had launched a, a call for tender last year and uh, the, the, we received the, 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 the um, in, in, earlier, earlier this year there was a full specifications and we received the, the proposals and now we're in, in selection, phase of selection. So we'll soon we'll, um, launch a, a new contract for running global land cover map with a change assessment starting from year 20 at 10 meter resolution. Uh, stuff based preferably on, on, on Copernicus uh, data and starting from year 2020 with updates 2021 up to 2026. Uh, this, this service should be put in place uh, next year and with the first map uh, hopefully by before the summer next year to be available and then the following uh, years. Uh, the following maps. That will help in particular to, to see the tree cover change over the time on, on an annual basis. It will also deliver composites, uh, seasonal or quarter, uh, quarter, yearly, quarterly, seasonal uh, information on the, um, derived from the observations observation, uh, something else, hopefully something like that. So that's, uh, just to say that that's the future, what Copernicus will provide as a service to fundamentally to support uh, the, the regulation and this issue of assessing deforestation and forest degradation. Uh, my uh, few final slides is to illustrate what uh, we, we have done at GRC in the context of uh, monitoring forest uh, deforestation and forest degradation. Uh, we have developed a system uh, on, over the tropical moist forest. It's based it was based on, uh, on it's mostly based on Landsat imagery with historical uh, data sets since early 90 and um, now we have uh, we'll illustrated that we have updated with Sentinel-2 at 10 meter. Uh, what, uh, that's an example when we zoom on a very local scale that the historical, so on the top, uh, top um, row you have on the left a high resolution imagery from planet and on the right uh, sentinel uh, 2 mosaic composite and below you have what our info, the, the system provides us information and in red and in particular in yellow and red you see what has been the disturbances in the forest cover uh, which has been uh, uh, which were happening in the previous these previous years it's typically a case of cocoa plantations under trees under forest cover in central cameroon and only with the historical information, uh, on, on it. it helps a lot to understand that that what there was a disturbance in that uh, forest cover uh, compared to the top row where we have detailed information, but you don't understand exactly. You see big trees, but you don't understand what is uh, happening below. Uh, and just to mention that we have updated uh, this map uh, for your, on your 2020. It's very recent, and now we have updated with uh, Sentinel two. So it's a finer resolution, 10 meter um, resolution showing. It shows the perspective, the improvements, and what we can get much finer details with uh, Sentinel-2 data. I don't know um, how much that, that, that was my last slide. If I have, a few, I don't know if you have a few minutes more, I just show quickly on my screen. So we have, um, as, as I mentioned, we have both on the, from our website, we can uh, show, yeah, sorry, for, from that uh, web, uh, link on the website, we, you, we can access both to, to our product on tropical moist forest and to, uh, we have also uh, information on the, the, our Sentinel-2 uh, mosaics. 
if I click on the Sentinel-2 mosaics, it's what's, uh, this one is an illustration of the Sentinel-2 mosaics for year uh, 2020. And just to show, so it's cloud-free because it's using a full uh, year of uh, Sentinel-2 imagery. And if we zoom, we have reduced it to 20 meter resolution, but it's uh, it's quite uh, impressive if we can, we can zoom at any, any place in the world. And, uh, looking up to 20 meter resolution. So that shows a bit the status, which was uh, of uh, forest cover. You see easily on this false composite, color composite, forest in green and, and then humid forest green and, and non-forest that is in, uh, in Brazilian Amazon where the clear cuts are very visible. So that's one illustration of what this kind of data can provide to you. And, and the analysis of the data, it's what, uh, when we click on, on the TMF, the website, uh, so we go to that level, uh, that brings you to that kind of imagery. And if I, uh, I was saying just to, to be, not to spend you too much time, uh, if I show the, this is the, the new map at 10 meters, including, which includes historical time series of Landsat at 30 meter resolution and uh, the new, uh, Sentinel-2 imagery for analysis of Sentinel-2 imagery for year uh, 2022, 20, and we get to, to this uh, level of details. So it's what we can expect in the future the, 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 with the new Copernicus service, service that will be launched to have the tree cover change. So there will be an additional layer which can help uh, in the monitoring the, the change of uh, in, in this kind of mask in, in the future. So I don't want, yeah. Uh, to leave a bit of time for the, the potential questions, and uh, I will stop stop now my my talk and be, be open back to to you to the audience thank for the questions. Yes, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation, and we actually have uh, quite a few questions. Um, so we have two that go around the the same line. Um, which is, uh, will Copernicus uh, offer a solution that helps uh, companies uh, checking their UDR compliance? So if uh, Copernicus would uh, act as a sort of third party providing uh, the service. So, so, so what, what I have presented is what Copernicus will provide. It will not provide more than that. The, the operators, uh, as I said, in a duty, the, the private operator, so for the the companies importing or exchanging uh, trading uh, commodities from outside the EU market or within the EU market from these key commodities, they will have to demonstrate that these commodities are not are deforestation free or forest degradation free. I don't, the forest degradation definition is very specific to the DUDR, so I don't want to, I don't think it's, um, we have time to discuss that. The deforestation is more, it's very close to the FAO definition of deforestation. It's a bit easier to understand, but, but whatever. So these uh, operators, these private operators will have to demonstrate that um, the, the, the commodities are coming from areas which were not forest in, at the end of at the cut of day 2020. It's their responsibility. There is, there's no responsibility for, from the EU to provide a reference map to tell you to tell them that's where the forest was in 2020. Having said that, at the GRC, we, will, uh, we, we, we are preparing a, a global baseline forest map at 10 meter resolution for the end of 2020. But uh, I was mentioning the issue of accuracies. These maps are never perfect. It would be a help. It will allow the, the, the operators to make uh, to use them in the risk assessment. If they have to to classify if the, the polygon is high risk, low risk, or medium risk, for them to decide if they can uh, import the commodity or not. If they if they detect a risk from any polygon, uh, cropland polygon, either from from a global map. Also, Inge was mentioning WRI is also producing such a global map at 10 meter resolution for year 2020. So if there is if there is a from any of these existing maps or national maps, there are a number of countries that we have we have maps available or which are uh, producing updating maps for year 2020 to be to help in the process of the regulation. If any of the, these maps will show a risk that uh, the, the cropland area was forest in 2020, it's up to the operator either to decide or to implement uh, 
a finer uh, scale a fi uh, assessment verification using either some sentinel 10 meter resolution focusing on the, on the area or, or going with much higher resolution data which exists on the market and uh, which can be uh, afforded by the private operators. It's, it's their responsibility. So it's not, there's no, in, in a, to be clear, I, I suppose that the question is a bit related to that, but in the regulation it's nowhere, it's clearly mentioned that the due diligence has to be made by the private operators, and then the verification is made by the, by the competent authorities, and nowhere uh, it's, it's, it's indicated that the, uh, there will be somewhere a, a global reference map. And it's, the point is that uh, to get very accurate maps of forest cover for specific areas, you cannot get that at the global level. It's technically feasible, but it will. Uh, you can imagine that the cost, the resources, is not in the hands of what uh, the, any the EC or any uh, global operator can can uh, can have uh, can, can make. So we, the, the, whatever the the double the global map which will come soon, by, hopefully by the end of the year, our map also global map which will come soon by the, hopefully we are pre, uh, targeting the end of the year. So we'll have to give you an idea and have a 80, 85% accuracy at, at the best. So if you have 80, 85% accuracy globally, it's, uh, it's, uh, you cannot, it's, it's not a guarantee. It means that there is 20% of, uh, of, of, uh, non, uh, of error or potential uh, mistakes. And only, again, uh, the only way to guarantee that uh, to, to, to go for finer um, accuracy is to focus at very local scale with uh, finer resolution imagery. Uh, you, you've actually answered quite a few questions in, in one, uh, because the, another one of the questions was actually related to um, if there would be any uh, formulation of this uh, forest uh, and baseline forest and risk maps uh, in collaboration with the producing countries. Um, and I also had a question regarding the, the technical challenges of increasing the, the accuracy of, of the cover maps beyond 75, which I, I assume that it's also limited by uh, the resolution of the Copernicus data. Um, we also had another question um, which is, uh, when will the EU observatory be ready for use and will it be publicly available for risk uh, assessment uh, by operators in line yeah. with what you mentioned? So, so the, 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 um, the, you, we, have the, we are in phase of uh, development of a platform for the EU observatory and we, our target, our goal is to have this platform uh, publicly open by the end of this year, by the end of 2023, which will be announced further. The GIAV as a multi-stakeholder um, platform for this regulation, for this deforestation uh, topic, and will there, there are regular meetings. Uh, there will be one after in October after the summer, and we'll announce first during that that meeting, which is open. I mean, the, in that um, there's a number of participants, and I think there's a new call to enlarge that multi-stakeholder platform. So, if anybody listening to that call is interested, to that um, webinar is interested, go don't hesitate to go to the DG Env website and to, to uh, apply for uh, being registered at that multi-stakeholder platform if you are not already in. So we announced that and we, we, we intend to have a first proto a first um, version of the web platform open by uh, at the end of this year. It will include this this first version of a global forest uh, ref uh, global forest baseline map. It will include what I've just shown on the TMF, our product on Tropical Moist Forest product. Um, what you have to also to maybe to, to comment or to add on the your previous comment, Sophia, is that uh, we are applying, uh, we intend to apply uh, methods at global or la over large scale, or large scale to be a bit consistent, to have a certain consistency in terms of, uh, we know, we are perfectly aware that when working at local scale or at national scale, the uh, accuracy might, might be higher. Maybe uh, because it's easier because you focus on specific area. This, of course, this national information should be used. Uh, it's not should. It's a, we recommend that this national information is used by uh, the operators for the due diligence for the risk assessment. It's only in case they don't have a national assessment that uh, the global global map may be uh, an alternative solution or combining both together. I say to 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 if you have more information, you have be more. Uh, uh, it's more robust, you're, 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 you're more, um, sorry, you're, you're, you're more confident in, in your risk assessment. So better if you have two, three, four maps, 
of course, they may provide different information, but at least you, uh, you it may increase also your confidence in saying it's a forest, it was a forest or not forest in year 2020. So we fully recommend, always recommend that if there are national maps, they should be used in the, in the risk assessment. They may not be included in the, in the global uh, forest map, which is, has to uh, be by, um, for, for consistency, which has to apply uh, approaches which are equal for any country. If, you, if we start to put together uh, different national maps, it may, be, may show differences at the borders, which might not be uh, scientifically uh, um, uh, consistent approach. So we, again, this is a bit open. We are scientists. We are, uh, we are always trying, trying, trying to improve the, the approaches and methods. But that is a bit the goal, just to give in a few words, that is the goal of, uh, for, for the next few months for providing this, uh, this product. And we have time for one last question. Um, we were being asked if this uh, baseline maps that have been produced, if um, if they differentiate uh, the different types of, of forests that are defined in the regulation, that is primary forest, naturally naturally regenerating forest, planted forest, etc. Yeah, <laughs> it's a, it's also very. <laughs> Very, very excellent question or very it's extremely challenging we realize that uh, and probably the, the I don't know who has made this question but uh, you are probably aware that mapping uh, providing a map of primary forest is extremely challenging so we have we, we think about so in and we understand fully that uh, as this four types primary uh, naturally regenerated plantations and planted forest are uh, mentioned in the definition are, uh, are explaining the definition of forest degradation of course it will be useful to 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 have as, as map as a special information uh, again it's very challenging we are trying to think about how best getting proxy you can have proxy in, by considering the impact forest on un, undisturbed forest if you don't see anything from satellite imagery it's a, it's a, an additional information that tells you there was no impact in the last years it's not a perfect solution, but it might be. So we are looking at this kind of uh, proxy, but it's uh, challenging, which means that the accuracy of such maps will be probably lower than the, the, the figures that I provided uh, before. Uh, we are we are looking scientifically at what what can be what can be possible, but again, I, I prefer to be very cautious and to tell you it's uh, we know that it will be it's a challenging task for us. Yes. Thank you very much for answering all these questions. We look forward to see what the next uh, steps are and what the, the next results and outcomes are um, from all this work. And I apologize uh, to the attendees uh, who posted some questions and that we don't have time to, to answer. Um, now, before we, we end, I want to uh, thank you again, uh, Frédéric and uh, Ine, for uh, your presentations. And uh, just to tell everyone that we're reaching the end of this 12th uh, Copernicus webinar, and uh, I want to thank both the speakers and uh, the audience for uh, joining us today and for being so engaged and participating so much. Uh, thank you for all the questions that you uh, that you shared with us. There was clearly a high interest in both presentations today. Now, before you all leave, uh, we would like to ask you one final question on Slido, as usual, uh, which is how useful have you found the content of this webinar? Now, also, uh, we would like to uh, remind you that if you have any questions or comments, you can reach us through our online channels, uh, which I invite you to follow in case you aren't already doing so, uh, to stay up to date with Copernicus. Now, thanks again for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Have an ASIC. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.